Hello, everyone, and uh, welcome to this uh, ITIF uh, webinar event titled Building on What Works, an Analysis of uh, U.S. Broadband Policy. Thank you all for uh, taking the time this morning to join us. I'm Doug Brake. I'm the Director of Broadband and Spectrum Policy at ITIF. For those of you not familiar with our organization, we're a think tank based in Washington, D.C. We focus on the intersection of innovation and tech policy, trying to formulate and promote those policies that we think advance innovation, uh, especially innovation as it affects economic growth. So uh, you all don't need to, me to tell you that 2020 has been a hell of a year. Uh, this pandemic has put a real spotlight on the digital tools, uh, like these ones, uh, that have been so critical in navigating this uh, difficult time, uh, giving a real imperative to policymakers to fix a set of intersecting challenges that have left too many on the wrong side of the digital divide. We also, you know, reaching the end of uh, 2020 um, after this, uh, this selection uh, cycle, find ourselves on the cusp of a new administration. Uh, while we don't yet know uh, who the FCC chair will be, or for that matter, uh, when they will be uh, seated, uh, it's still a good time, a good opportunity uh, to sort of take stock, uh, take an analysis and evaluation of broadband policy, where we've been, um, you know, in the last few years, last few decades even, uh, and evaluate what has worked well and what hasn't, um, and try to uh, set a course for the next few years to come. Uh, so uh, we've gathered this uh, this panel of speakers uh, to do uh, to do that. We have. Uh, a recent paper by John Nuchaline and Howard Shalansky, who I will uh, introduce more fully in just a moment. Uh, they published a paper right to, uh, to do that, to, to take an evaluation of uh, broadband policy and sort of uh, chart a course for, uh, for, for what to come. I think this paper presents uh, a very compelling analysis of many of the high level questions around regulation of broadband. Um, and, and also uh, and gives a, a good direction of, uh, of the, <laughs> of the uh, possible options for us to, to move forward. Uh, so a quick note on the run of show. Uh, we divided uh, the next hour and a half uh, into roughly into thirds. So first, uh, I'll uh, very shortly turn it over to John and Howard, who have a, a presentation uh, to go over the paper, the, their analysis, uh, and arguments. Uh, next, we will hear responses from uh, Chris Lewis uh, of Public Knowledge and Blair LeBen, who I will introduce uh, uh, when it comes time for, for them to speak. And then the last third of, uh, of our event, uh, we set up for, for q and I have a few questions of my own, but uh, we're hoping to do our best to, to recreate you know, what we would have preferred to have a more interactive uh, uh, um, uh, uh, panel in our, uh, in our actual event space. And so I'll be monitoring. We have our uh, question uh, submission platform on our website. Uh, so those of you uh, watching the live stream, please feel free to, to enter questions. I'll also be keeping an eye on uh, our hashtag ITIF broadband. Uh, for any questions that uh, or engagement that, that folks want to uh, want to um, uh, take on there. Uh, so with that, let me go ahead and introduce our uh, two presenters uh, who will be presenting their paper, Jonathan Neutraline. John is a partner and co-leader of Sidley's Telecom and Internet Competition Practice, where he focuses on telecommunications law, antitrust, and appellate litigation. He served as general counsel for the Federal Communications Commission and deputy general counsel of the Federal Communications Commission as well. He also is a, is a longtime writer, thinker on these issues, um, and co-authored one of the, the key books, uh, Digital Crossroads, uh, that covers a wide swath of, uh, of broadband policy and telecommunications uh, more generally. Uh, Howard Shalansky. Howard is professor of law at Georgetown University and also a partner in Davis Polk's litigation department in Washington, D.C. He's one of the nation's leading authorities on antitrust and regulation, particularly the intersection of innovation with uh, both antitrust and regulation. Um, and he has high level experience with the Federal Trade Commission, the Federal Communications Commission, uh, and the executive branch of the government having read uh, the OIRA office uh, under President Obama. Uh, so with that, Howard and John, I'll turn the, the stream over to you for, for your presentation of your paper. Thanks so much. Thanks, Doug. Um, hi, everyone. Uh, as Doug says, I'm, I'm John Nectarline, and I'm delighted to <clears throat> be accompanied by everyone here today. Um, we're going to talk <clears throat> uh, 
about um, the right circumstances for economic uh, regulation of the broadband uh, industry. We'll get into that in a minute, but I wanna begin with um, a framing device, which is 2020 is a noteworthy year for all sorts of reasons, some of them good, some of them very, very bad. But 2020 is also a noteworthy year because it marks several different anniversaries in telecom policy. Uh, if we could go to the first slide, please. So the first milestone is it's been 10 years since Blair and team uh, issued the national broadband plan. plan. Blair is free to disagree with me if he likes, but I've always viewed that broadband plan is a case study in regulatory humility. I pulled out some quotes here. Um, it is important for us in DC not to exaggerate the role of public policy in, um, in the development of the broadband industry. On the other hand, it's also very important that to the extent that we do impose forms of regulatory intervention on the broadband industry, that we do so in a data-driven and targeted way. Some of the insights that you read in the broadband plan are that uh, broadband progress is fueled not so much by government um, intervention as by private sector investment and innovation. Um, the government also needs to bear in mind that it has a hard time sometimes predicting the future of an industry that's inherently dynamic and that to the extent that the government does try to shape the future of the broadband industry, the best way for it to do so is to act as a complement to private sector uh, innovation and investment rather than um, a source of restrictions or disincentives for innovation and investment. Um, can we go to the next slide, please? Okay, the second um, milestone I want to talk about is it's uh, been 20 years since Howard and I were at the FCC together under the leadership of Bill Kennard. I remember the hot issue of the day was this new thing called cable modem service. What is it? What? How should we regulate it? How should we think about it within the context of the Communications Act? And I was in these meetings where people just seemed uh, at the same time confused and fascinated. They knew that this was a huge development in, um, in the history of American communications, but they didn't quite know how to conceptualize it for regulatory purposes. And I think the, the ultimate conclusion of the FCC during that era, and this really bridged Bill Kennard's <clears throat> uh, tenure with Michael Powell's a couple of years later, Bill Bernard had a speech in which he, um, he, he gave these great quotes, one of which is, um, we have to get the pipes built. Uh, the most important challenge facing America is affordable, ubiquitous access to high quality broadband. What's the most effective way of achieving that objective? And uh, Bill Kennard tapped back into a longstanding tradition of the FCC uh, of not regulating information services. Um, and the, the premise of that was that broadband internet access was of a piece with the services at that time being offered by dial-up ISPs. We do want to stay away in this presentation from um, excessively high level debates about whether Title I or Title II is the right regulatory approach. Obviously people, reasonable people have very different views on that topic. One of the takeaways that we're going to reach though is that at the end of the day, labels don't matter as much as substantive policy and just as important what industry perceives that substantive policy to be. Go to the next slide, please. All right, the third uh, milestone that we want to talk about is uh, it has been now, and it seems like just yesterday, a quarter of a century since uh, the House and Senate finally got the act together, their act together, met in conference, and issued the Telecommunications Act of 1996. Obviously, landmark legislation, it did a lot of good. It eliminated, for example, exclusive franchise arrangements that created 
de jure monopolies in a variety of municipalities. Um, and it, it did a number of other important work too. For example, it concentrated regulatory authority with the FCC at a time when the lines between inter and intrastate services were beginning to blur. And so it created a rational mechanism for a nationally coordinated telecommunications policy. But for those of us above a certain age, we also remember the Telecommunications Act of 1996 as spurring a decade of extremely litigious issues regarding the unbundling of network elements by landline telephone companies. There was a whole period of time in which the whole DC telecom bar, it seemed like, was arguing about whether, whether and under what terms new entrants could challenge landline circuit switched telephone companies for the provision of residential services to consumers. That was the big issue of the day. And it's kind of quaint to remember it, um, but it may hold lessons for us now because um, at that time, well, people like me were arguing about the fine points of Telric and whether shared transport should be a network element so that AT&T Corp could offer the uni platform in competition with the baby bells. That really was how I spent the early years of the 21st century. Um, while all that regulatory churn was going on, something more interesting was happening, which was um, what mobile wireless companies were beginning to show consumers that they were a not only a substitute for landline telephony, at least in the residential context, but preferable to landline telephony for um, an obvious reason. Mobile phones are mobile and landline phones are not. And you know, when the 96 Act was passed, everybody had a landline phone in their homes. Today, um, I think the vast majority of Americans either don't even have a landline connection or they rely entirely on mobile phones. That was one of the technological developments that people weren't paying close attention to when they were focusing so heavily on the local competition provisions of the 96 Act. The other um, equally important development that people overlooked was the growth of broadband internet access over um, intermodal facilities. So cable companies in particular began to build out last mile um, two-way networks to residential homes throughout America. Um, they soon added voice services to those. And the local competition that um, Congress believed that regulators would have to superintend for a long time didn't actually come from any of the litigation under the 96 Act. It came from companies that really weren't even beneficiaries of the 96 Act, at least in any major respect. These were the cable companies and the mobile phone companies. So competition came from market dynamics, not so much from regulation. So here are the lessons from these um, three milestones that I've talked about. Um, the first two are salutary reminders that um, the FCC does its best work when it focuses on the facts as the broadband plan did in 2010. And it recognizes the complexity of markets and it promotes um, policies that enhance rather than undermine private investment. Um, Bill Kennard's uh, remarks on, the, uh, on how to think about cable modem services in 2000, 1999, those were also part and parcel of that same ethic of data-driven broadband policy. The, 99, the, 1999, the 1996 Act offers a more cautionary tale um, about how even the best intentioned regulators um, can sometimes act on mistaken assumptions about technological change, as well as the limits of regulatory intervention. Um, could we have the next slide, please? So, before I turn this over to Howard, I just wanted to scope out what we're talking about today, because when people talk about broadband policy, they, the term is 
um, sometimes a bit vague, and we should just be clear about what we are and are not addressing today. So our paper, and by extension, our presentation is about economic regulation of broadband services. Uh, that is to be distinguished from a variety of other forms of regulation that might properly be termed consumer protection uh, regulation or universal service. These, when we talk about economic regulation, we're talking about rules that are designed to constrain the exercise of market power, either directly through price caps for dominant firms or indirectly by requiring dominant firms to deal with other firms, for example, through asset sharing of the type that we saw in the 96 Act. We are not, therefore, talking about other forms of regulation that apply irrespective of market power. So we're not talking about consumer privacy. We're not talking about truth of billing. Uh, <clears throat> we're not talking about um, the obligation of ISPs to tell consumers how they, uh, what, what their service will look like and how their networks are being managed. We're obviously not talking about how the FCC um, manages scarce spectrum assets. And finally, we're not talking about <clears throat> conditions that the FCC or the states can impose on uh, genuinely voluntary participation in discretionary funding programs. So with that, I will turn it over to Howard to set the stage for what we see as the appropriate context for uh, and against economic regulation. Great, thanks very much, John. And um, like John, I'm very glad to be here with everybody. Thanks very much for to ITIF for inviting us to participate and certainly to Chris and Blair uh, for commenting. Um, uh, John and I would also like to thank the United States Telecommunications Association for funding related research. Um, so when is economic re uh, regulation appropriate? You know, John just, uh, I think, very nicely framed the kind of regulation that we're talking about in this particular presentation. To be sure, there are many kinds of regulation that benefit consumers that can deal with equity issues. Those are all things that we are viewing as a little bit different from the specific kinds of regulation we're talking about, which, as John said, are, are rules that directly or indirectly are designed to constrain market power and to deal with failures uh, of competition. And in that regard, um, I think a very important thing in understanding when um, economic regulation is appropriate is to think about uh, what we're trying to uh, what we are trying to argue when we argue that economic regulation is appropriate. Regulation is um, always, almost always, a second best outcome. It, is, it almost inevitably introduces distortions into a marketplace. And therefore, it is to be used where the market itself is at such a degree of underperformance that even notwithstanding the distortions that regulation introduces, it is superior to what the market would produce. So in that regard, um, regulation is not something that we view as appropriate to introduce just because there are some shortcomings in the market. They rather have to be shortcomings in the market that regulation will improve upon. And there are some conditions that we think typify the markets in which the government does tend to intervene successfully uh, with economic regulation. And we discuss several or list several of them here. Um, typically, uh, economic regulation is reserved for markets that are mature, an industry that's been developing for some time, where the structure of the market is dominated by durable monopolies. That is to say, not just entities that have uh, for a short period of time uh, acquired some large share of users or, or, or of sales in the marketplace, but where there's some reason to believe that that share of the market is durable uh, to the point of, of conferring long-lasting monopoly power, monopoly power that's hard to contest by new entrants. Which takes us to the third uh, uh, characteristic, which is durable, durable monopolies are one where serious prospects for competitive entry, at least within a reasonable time frame going forward, um, do not exist. 
um, where that monopoly is not going to be contested and can sit back and, in the words of Sir John Hicks, uh, enjoy the best of all rewards um, uh, to, for monopoly, which is a quiet life. Um, so, so when is there a reasonable prospect of competitive entry that will disquiet the comfortable monopoly? Uh, where that is lacking, uh, that tends to be a, a, a circumstance in which regulation might be appropriate. Another characteristic that's very important is that most of the markets in which the governments uh, around the world and in the United States have intervened with economic regulation, at least intervened successfully, are those where technology has reached uh, some reasonable equilibrium, where the changes to technology or consumer demand are relatively incremental and gradual. And we're not looking uh, at, at moments of potentially transformative change. And the classic examples are electric power uh, and the local telephone markets of the mid 20th century. Um, regulation was by no means perfect in any of those markets. But the conditions were such, and the conditions very much match those that we just listed, that even very imperfect interventions into the market could improve over the underperformance of a mature, stable, uncontested monopoly in a relatively stable industry. Um, in those settings, the cost benefit calculus, when you're weighing the costs and benefits of regulation, the distortions that regulation can introduce, uh, tend to tip in favor of economic regulation. The benefits are relatively straightforward. Um, although a regulator may not be able to exactly mirror what the price would be in a hypothetical competitive market, um, the regulator is likely to be able to hit the zone between that level and the monopoly level and at least set a price that is closer to the efficient level than that which the market, the monopolist, would set itself. The costs of imposing regulation are much lower. Uh, by hypothesis, technological change is relatively slow and the odds of competitive entry are slim. What that means is if the regulator overshoots the mark and imposes returns that might in some degree be less than would be generated in a, in a, in a stable, you know, competitive unregulated market, you're unlikely to be deterring entry because this is a situation in which we've already determined that uh, the market is not terribly contestable. You may not be deterring uh, new investment and technological change because uh, as a general matter, uh, the underperformance of the market tends to be exacerbated where that kind of change is not forthcoming and disruption is unlikely. So the costs of regulation, the potential di distorting and deterrent effects of regulation uh, tend to be relatively modest where the conditions uh, that we display on the slide here hold. And the benefits tend to be uh, relatively achievable and more likely to outweigh those uh, those uh, those benefits, uh, I mean, those costs, excuse me. If we go to the next slide, please. So when is economic regulation inappropriate? When markets are subject to competition, or there is at least a real prospect of emerging competition, and this tends to coincide often where there is a technological inflection point, a new technology coming into the market, or um, uh, you know, consumer demand is in a dynamic phase and tending to shift in ways to which new suppliers are orienting. The cost-benefit analysis for economic regulation tends to shift fundamentally. Now, I want to be clear, this does not mean these markets are going to perform perfectly. What it means is economic regulation is very unlikely to improve on the performance and in fact may do affirmative harm. So the benefits in a market that is subject to competition and technological change and shifting uh, consumer demand tend to be lower for a couple of reasons. Competition by definition moves prices closer to competitive levels. And because regulators are not omniscient, they now have a much more difficult target to hit. If the price that is being generated in a market is not a monopoly profit, but something lower, by definition, the gap between the competitive price and the price that the market is, is, is producing is going to be narrower. And that is a narrower target zone for regulators to hit in getting the price right. 
And you need to be very careful because you might say, well, just take the price that the market produces, look at ways in which we would hypothesize the market is underperforming and set the price lower, just a bit lower. What can be the harm there? Well, there are affirmative costs that can result from trying to uh, hit that narrow, narrower price gap between the price that the market is, is, is producing and some hypothesized competitive price. One cost is that economic regulation in this context runs a much greater uh, a much greater risk of deterring uh, three things. One is competitive entry by new firms. Competitive entrants tend to invest and to come into the marketplace where profit opportunities exist. And while it might look harmless to second guess what a partially competitive or a an emerging competitive market produces as the market price, that that margin that can be earned is also the attractant for entering the market. And so interestingly, just lowering the price a bit below what the market is preserving could be the very thing that preserves incumbency rather than attracts entry. And you run a much greater risk of making that error. Um, it's not to say it can't be done. This is all a question of risks and what regulators can feasibly and practically achieve. They're much less likely uh, to hit that target. And then there are uh, there are additional costs. Uh, the idea that the incumbent, where those prices are being re reduced, is going to be uh, investing more in their network uh, is 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 less likely to hold true uh, when uh, when the returns on that investment are being reduced. And this is especially true when it's not just a matter of maintaining and expanding an existing technology or an existing network. But when there's technological change coming into the market and ways that consumers are using various products uh, are, are shifting. So when demand is shifting and technology is shifting, those are additional forms of investment uh, that we want to incentivize. And we want to incentivize it not just by the incumbents. We want to incentivize it for new entrants who might come in and benefit from the period of demand change or technological change to enter a market that might otherwise be stable or difficult uh, to enter. And economic regulation uh, in, in, in that circumstance, whether it is direct regulation on prices or indirect regulation involving network sharing, um, uh, tends to work against both of those objectives. Will it always defeat them? No, but the target at which the regulator is shooting is much narrower right in the middle of a context where the benefits that the market is likely to produce uh, are much greater. Um, we think that the U.S., and if we go to the next, uh, the next slide, please. Um, we think that the U.S. broadband market is much more like the latter set of markets, shifting markets, dynamic markets, markets on the cusp of entry, than they are like the very stable kinds of markets of the kinds of utilities that have traditionally successfully been regulated through economic regulation. And I, I want to just uh, pause for a minute to emphasize a point that John raised. Um, it was very interesting in 2000, you know, 1999, 2000, to be going to telecommunications conferences, going to academic conferences, going to industry conferences. And, and there was still very much an, uh, you know, a, 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 a divergence in views. People who were in the industry were often saying, you know, all of this stuff about network unbundling is increasingly beside the point. What mattered was state monopoly preemption and interconnection, uh, traffic interconnection. That's what mattered. The reason that that's what mattered is all of this local landline stuff is increasingly beside the point. And I remember I used to do an experiment. I used to, you know, every year I started teaching uh, in 1996. And I would ask my students, how many of you do not have a landline phone? and it would just be one or two people in 1996. By 2000, it was a big swath of my classroom. By 2003, 2004, it was the whole class raising their hand that they you know, were doing without a landline. A very rapid time period. I think now if you start to talk to people about how they consume data services and what kinds of data services they consume, it's very interesting that the same kind of shift um, is underway. If you look at usage patterns on mobile devices, they are increasingly shifting not to 
you know, pure, you know, communication services, but to video consumption and passive video consumption. That is to say, not sharing videos with your friends and family or sending video messages, but consuming videos produced by others that you don't know, a pure follower model. And that is increasingly the largest use case on mobile devices, moving a lot of the use case that we tend to think of as characterizing uh, broadband to mobile. Uh, and then, of course, rich communications features are increasingly moving to mobile. And so at the very same time that we're having debate about you know, landline broadband, there tends to be a very similar kind of migration and technological shift. So a technological shift, but also a consumer migration that we could see happening in real time 20 years ago and that John talked about in the telephone uh, context. Um, but just to talk um, a, a little bit about why we think the US broadband market lacks the features justifying major economic regulation, um, when it comes to facilities-based uh, competition, uh, recall the national broadband plan. The US market structure is relatively unique in that many countries have a single dominant nationwide fixed telecommunications provider, whereas the United States has numerous providers, including cable companies, which play a more prominent role in our broadband system than in other countries. That is something that has become more rather than less true since the national broadband plan. And one of the important things to recognize in an industry that has high fixed costs and low marginal costs is that even a small number of competitors can support substantial competition in such industries and make regulation of such markets much more risky. So for that reason, given the cost structure of the industry, given the uh, shift of demand that we're starting to see, and John will say a little bit more uh, about that, um, and the inflection point where we are with respect to uh, consumer preferences, we don't think that the US broadband market today um, uh, contains the features that would justify economic regulation uh, of the kind that our paper focuses on. And with that, I'll turn it over to John to say a little bit more about that. Thanks, Howard. Um, so with respect to um, the existing um, regulatory framework, obviously there's going to be a lot of discussion in the new administration as well there should be um, about how to uh, map out the future of broadband policy in, in the 2020s and, and beyond. Um, one of our recommendations is that when regulators think about competitive conditions in the broadband market. They think not just in terms of today's static snapshot, um, but also in terms of what the market will look like in the mid 2020s, getting towards the end of the 2020s. In the same vein, it would have been nicer if Congress, in retrospect, if Congress had waited a couple years before enacting the Telecommunications Act of 1996, which all but overlooked the transformative role that broadband was going to play in the um, telecommunications landscape in the US. Um, here too, we are at an inflection point and it's worth remembering the lessons of landline telephony here too. It wasn't, I think it was just 10, that was nine years ago that I unsuccessfully tried to persuade the 10th circuit that the FCC had acted arbitrarily in concluding that mobile phones were an inadequate substitute for landline telephony uh, and that huge numbers of Americans were never going to switch from their landline phones to mobile phones. Um, today, we hear similar um, arguments that mobile and fixed broadband are hermetically sealed off from one another, that they are different markets. And as I think you know, one, one often hears, you can't type a homework paper on a cell phone. Well, you can type a ho homework paper on a cell phone if you tether the cell phone to a laptop. And then the response is usually, well, mobile providers impose usage restrictions that um, limit the consumer's ability to uh, use mobile broadband connections to the same extent that they use landline broadband connections. And that 
is somewhat true today. Um, it is less. It is likely to become less and less true as 5G rolls out. Why? Two things are happening. Uh, one is that the traditional landline uh, broadband companies, including cable companies, are building uh, ubiquitous Wi-Fi networks that enable portability of their service and ultimately mobility. That's what 5G helps them do. At the same time, m traditional mobile broadband companies are <clears throat> deploy as they deploy 5G will deploy smaller and smaller cell sites with ubiquitous fiber backhaul. And what that means is that if you are a consumer operating in any of these very small cell sites, you have a lot of the spectrum to yourself, or at least you're sharing it with only a few people. So the economic reasons why mobile providers impose usage restrictions today uh, will become less and less relevant as 5G rolls out. There will be less of a need to ration access to spectrum as cell sites become smaller and smaller, and the same amount of spectrum or increasing spectrum uh, gets recycled as you, as you walk down the street. So as the line, what, what I see happening is some degree of convergence. And we don't want to make <clears throat> confident predictions because maybe it won't happen in the next two or three years. But it will happen um, in, at some point in the next decade. There will be a significant blurring of lines between landline and mobile broadband providers. And what that means is that in any given uh, area, you're likely to have not just a couple of home broadband providers, you're likely to have three or four or five because guess what? T-Mobile is gonna be competing directly with Comcast and CenturyLink to provide uh, a home broadband uh, service. And so are, will be Verizon and AT&T. Could you go to the next slide, please? Um, I actually am mindful of uh, time here. And uh, Doug is reminding us to pick up the pace, which we will do. Um, I, I just want to show a few slides um, to uh, illustrate why the broadband marketplace is not the sort of marketplace, the sort of stable, monopolistic environment where you would normally expect to see economic regulation. The amount of investment is extreme. I mean, we, we've seen $1.7 trillion of investment uh, since 1996, in excess of $70 billion each year since I think about 2013 uh, to build out faster, wider broadband networks throughout America. Next slide. Um, that is, those numbers are impressive, not just in isolation, but also in comparison to other countries. Um, this chart uh, illustrates where we are in the United States, where the blue rectangle on the left, that um, that's our per capita broadband investment, uh, we, which exceeds the broadband investment you see in most other countries. And why, why are these broadband providers investing so much? rather than just kind of, you know, resting on their laurels and, and earning the cash flow. Well, it's because they know they are facing competition, not just today's present day competition, but also what's around the corner. And they have to keep investing and in improving their services in order to survive. Next slide, please. Um, and <laughs> most of us uh, can remember what it was like to use broadband in 2000. I had a DSL line and it was terrible. Um, I didn't think it was terrible at the time. I thought it was pretty good. Um, compared to um, uh, dial-up. But uh, th this chart illustrates just how far broadband providers have succeeded in improving the qualitative experience of broadband over the last 10 years. Um, and at the same time, of course, prices, if you measure them by unit of consumption, have plummeted. They've gone from something like uh, $20 per, uh, I think it's something like $20 per megabyte to um, uh, to less than a dollar. Uh, next slide, please. So just to, um, this, uh, and actually at this point, I think I'm gonna turn it back to Howard. Sure, yeah, I mean, ju just to recap very briefly, um, you know, I think John has pointed out that there have been real benefits to 
the marketplace as it has developed since the National Broadband Plan. Um, and uh, if, if we look at applying major economic regulation uh, in this context, we need to just think about the costs and the benefits. And to recap, the benefits of economic regulation are likely to be uh, lowest. And in fact, the, the risks of such regulation for investment and innovation are likely to be greatest under the conditions that we've described in technologically dynamic industries where there is some and some competition today, but uh, significant anticipated uh, competition coming forward. Uh, that explains a lot of the investment uh, profile and dynamics that we've seen. And if we just look at the example of, uh, of price regulation, um, you can look at rate caps that are applied only to an incumbent or dominant provider. That's often something that people uh, you know, say, say would be harmless, but that's not the case at all because by shrinking the margin that competitive entrants can earn and the margin that can be earn, earned on expansion, there is at least a marginal uh, 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 reduction in the incentive to expand or to enter those markets in the first place. So for example, if we were just to suppose that regulators capped the retail rates of fixed line home broadband services, those new rate caps are not just on the incumbent um, fixed line uh, home service providers. They have to be lived with and they affect the environment in which mobile providers would be making risky investments to compete head to head and indeed uh, uh, perhaps to exceed fixed line providers because the uh, mobile providers own expected revenues are going to be affected by the caps that are on the fixed line providers. And for consumers, what that means is less intense fixed versus mobile competition um, that, and over the long term, presumably up uh, higher quality adjusted prices. So looking ahead, if we could flip to the next slide, uh, we think that there are some significant challenges for the broadband marketplace. We, uh, we do not think that the end of or, you know, the case against economic regulation is the case against public policy for broadband. But we need to be very clear about what problems we're trying to solve and how we're trying to solve them. We think that market power, market forces, when they work well, are unmatched in their power to bring the greatest benefit to the greatest number. But market forces by themselves will not help America close two digital divides. The digital divide between rich and poor, mostly an affordability issue, and between urban and rural, often not just an affordability issue, but a facilities issue. As the COVID-19 pandemic uh, has underscored, broadband is critical to equal opportunity and to full participation in civic and economic life it's critical for employment, it's critical for education. And underemployment during this very same period has reduced the affordability of broadband for many Americans. And at the same time, Americans in rural areas cannot buy the connectivity they need at any price or at least any price that's at all feasible for the vast majority of people. So the great broadband challenge of the next decade, we think is to close both of these divides by boosting adoption in low-income communities and by boosting deployment in high-cost areas. The solution to these two divides, we think, lies not in major economic regulation. Indeed, we think it could work against closing those divides. But in ramping up targeted subsidy programs that can help in a much more efficient way uh, to directly address those, uh, those uh, very important challenges. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you so much, uh, Howard John, for that uh, that excellent presentation of, uh, of your paper. Uh, John, realizing, I apologize uh, earlier, mispronounced your name is, of course, Nectarline. So uh, for those of you watching, don't want to, you know, get that uh, mispronunciation. You're not the first to get along. <laughs> I probably heard it from someone else. Um, so, so with that, um, I think we'll transition to the to the response uh, portion of our of our event. Um, I think first we have teed up uh, Christopher Lewis, uh, who I'd like to introduce. Um, Chris is, of course, the current president and CEO of Public Knowledge, where he has served in various roles since 2012. 
Before joining Public Knowledge, Chris worked at the Federal Communications Commission in the Office of Legislative Affairs. And before that, uh, we worked on the on the Hill on communications and uh, and other issues as well. Uh, a, a great leader in the space uh, with uh, with Public Knowledge. Uh, so, Chris, I'll turn it over to you. We'll give you uh, you know you know five ten minutes uh, for your your thoughts on uh, John and Howard's uh, paper and presentation uh, before hearing a a response from them in turn. Chris, thank you. Great, thanks Doug for inviting me and uh, thanks to ITIF. Uh, this is an important discussion because, uh, and congrats to, to John and Howard on their paper um, because this is, you know, if anyone is new and watching this and new to broadband policy, this is to me the crux of the debate um, around most of the issues that we're dealing with. And um, and I, I felt their their pain about uh, you know they wrote this long paper and then they're trying to squeeze it all into a short presentation. Uh, I feel like there's a lot to respond to uh, that they presented and and also a short amount of time. So I'll try and focus on a few things, especially some definitions and assumptions that I think are critically important to question um, uh, in their presentation and as we talk about. Uh, uh, I think some of the shared goals around closing the digital divide, uh, making sure that broadband meets the needs of everyone, that it's affordable, uh, that it is uh, of a certain quality so that it, we're getting all the, the new innovative uses. I think those are all shared goals. Uh, but some of the assumptions and definitions we really need to wrestle with. Um, uh, start with, um, you know, the really interesting uh distinction between economic and non-economic regulation, uh, and they cite consumer privacy, truth and billing, uh, network management disclosures, uh, discretionary funding programs, and, and yet uh, in the broadband policy debate for years now, uh, other uh, regulations uh, that, you know, since they excluded those, other regulations that are tied to and linked to some of the ones that they listed are critically important, and yet they are labeled economic regulation. Um, and so it really begs the question of, of the definitions of economic regulation and whether they apply here. Uh, it seems like we're kind of using economic language to limit the public interest uh, underpinnings of the Communications Act and the FCC, and that ignores the mix of both economic factors and the reality of public interest needs. Uh, so for example, um, you know, here's some examples that have been labeled economic regulation, uh, certainly by uh, industry players. Uh, you know, let's talk, start with the, the most popular one, net neutrality. Um, uh, net neutrality is not just network management disclosures, it's more than that. Uh, it deals with the power in the marketplace to block and throttle content. It deals with the interconnection between uh, large players and small players. Uh, it deals with uh, self-preferencing uh, through things like data caps and data limits. Um, those are all rules that can constrain the exercise of, the, of market power. Uh, those are all rules that uh, set terms on how different corporate corporations interact with each other straight out of uh, their definition of, of economic regulation. Um, and yet uh, there is a public interest component to it that I think is missing uh, to make sure that there's fairness uh, that goes beyond disclosures. Um, and, uh, and, and what you'll see with my examples is all of these come to dealing with the authority that is important at the agency uh, to deal with these things and the mix of the economic and the public interest need. Another one is uh, pricing. Uh, we, you know, we have truth in billing as a non-economic regulation, uh, and yet uh, the fact of the matter is that uh, prices are going up. Uh, you know, just in the last month, we heard Comcast and Charter increasing their prices on broadband. Um, truth in billing is not the only pub, uh, need that we need in regulation, uh, and and when when it's needed, uh, we don't have an agency with the authority to deal with it right now. So we're making assumptions that economic uh, regulation is not needed, and yet uh, the power of the uh, of the the industry players is clear uh, that they can control these things. They are controlling these things, and the lack of competition uh, is growing and also clear. We'll come back to that. Uh, other ones I want to note: um, uh, not just consumer privacy, but the real concern about the importance of of uh, data sharing and data control um, is being discussed around not just broadband but also uh, digital platforms uh, writ large. Uh, and then also uh, service obligations. You know, 
the challenge of closing the digital divide is not just about funding programs, um, let alone discretionary funding programs. There are other reasons for the digital divide uh, that are, are not included in the assumptions here. Um, for example, and there are studies to show this, uh, digital redlining is real. Uh, urban areas, uh, people are not being left out just because they can't afford broadband, although they are being left out because they can't afford broadband. But redlining is real and some neighborhoods are served better than others. Um, the rural-rural divide is real. Um, and so to make sure that um, uh, service obligations aren't uh, just included in an urban area to deal with digital redlining, but also to deal with uh, the population center versus outskirts problems in rural areas. Uh, uh, poor network maintenance is real. It's why the FCC has engaged in uh, actions to look at the quality of, of network upgrades. Um, uh, as as technology is is, adva is advanced. Um, th this also occurs in natural disasters. Outages are real, uh, and we need an FCC with the authority to look at these issues. And all of these, um, you know, are usually labeled as uh, economic regulation by industry, um, and yet there's a, a dual um, uh, public interest component to them. And so it's important while, uh, you know, uh, John and Howard started off talking about not wanting to get into an authority conversation, a Title I versus Title II conversation. We can't avoid it because of the public interest needs that come with these economic regulations. Um, I'm short on time. Uh, uh, I'll pick a few other things here um, just to, to note. Um, great conversation, guys, about, um, and, and one that needs to continue, about the... Um, the competition argument, uh, whether there is real competition, whether mobile is competitive or not. Uh, it's noteworthy that you were comparing uh, surveys and, and, and data that comes in about landline versus uh, mobile, uh, but you're talking about phones. Um, I think it was John who then dove in, I think uh, appropriately into, okay, but what about actual uses of broadband, not actual telephony uh, is critically important. And, you know, uh, most studies that I've seen out there show that people are choosing uh, to have both mobile and uh, fixed or home uh, broadband uh, because they use them for different purposes. Um, EFF has done some work on this and there are in their studies on fiber uh, and the importance of rolling out fiber to everyone. Uh, you know, uh, most low income folks don't, you know, they, they disproportionately use uh, mobile only. Uh, that's an economic choice, but if they had the means, uh, they would be using both because people use them differently, um, not just for writing papers, um, but, uh, but for uh, the new ways that people are communicating, uh, whether we're talking real-time uh, uh, doctor's visits, real-time education. Uh, folks aren't doing that on their mobile phones. They need either a laptop or or a smart TV. Uh, you know, the devices are changing, uh, but the larger screen, uh, and the more fixed uh, usages are what we're seeing uh, occur in the marketplace right now. And to leave folks out from that uh, uh, and just say that mobile is a competitor or a replacement to fix is not what we're seeing in the actual marketplace uh, in how consumers are using. And those are real economic um, realities, uh, how consumers are choosing to use the technology. Um, uh, I'm hopeful for 5G, but we have yet to see it become a real substitute. Um, you know, there's been studies about speeds. If you're just looking at speeds alone, about uh, you know 5G, depending on which uh, spectrum band they're using, uh, so which type of 5G they're using, uh, whether uh, it truly is better uh, than 4G. You know, the speeds are, can be comparable in some bands, but in other bands, uh, they are faster, and yet uh, they can't be used for the same purposes, and they're uh, more applicable to things like in-home uh, smart devices uh, and smart home applications uh, because of the propagation of the spectrum. So, um, so we've yet to see 5G become a real substitute. Um, I think the conversation around data caps um, is important. It's why we want authority at the agency to deal with net neutrality um, and, and to look at data caps and data limits uh, because, uh, you know, forgetting if it was John or Howard talked about uh, there'll be less and less a need for these data limits. But we've already seen in history that even when there is not a need for these data limits, um, uh, that companies do it anyway. 
that they use it to, to make more money off of consumers. Um, look at, for example, Comcast recently raising their fixed uh, data limits. Uh, this you know has nothing to do, and, and there's never been any proof that uh, fixed broadband needs data limits, and yet they're doing it and allows them to tier pricing and to make more money. Uh, it's hard to understand why the mobile companies would leave that behind, even if the technology advances to a place where they don't need data limits. Um, it's a mechanism for creating more profit. Um, uh, we, you guys didn't really get to jump much into the broadband investment stuff, so I'll, I'll leave that alone. But I think uh, it's thoroughly been de debunked uh, that uh, broadband investment uh, is matched to regulatory action. Uh, Free Press has done the best studies on this, I think, so far. Um, the industry itself notes that uh, they make their investments based on long-term planning and cycles, uh, not on regulatory action. In fact, uh, you know some of the uh, investments made. Uh, uh, in the numbers that you showed from companies like AT&T and CenturyLink were planned out years ago and had little to do with the change in the regulatory uh, environment in the last three or four years. Um, competition, uh, and I'm probably running out of time here. Um, competition, uh, I'll real quickly just say, um, is something we need to see and we're not seeing in the marketplace for consumers. So the reality is, is that 22 million uh, consumers uh, have only access to Comcast as a high-speed broadband provider. I'm one of them. Alexandria, Virginia, right inside the Beltway, urban area, the city of Alexandria, one choice for high-speed broadband. And there are 22 million of us across the country. So locally, we do not have competition. Uh, 25 million only have access to charter. Uh, and that doesn't even get to the folks who live in small rural communities and are served by smaller providers uh, who are you know, the only providers willing to make the investment to serve uh, low density population areas. So uh, we have not seen accurate studies of competition uh, in the broadband marketplace. Uh, I would love to see it at the agency level. I'd love to see it in Congress. Uh, All right. Uh, thanks so much. Thanks so much, Chris. I, I think, unfortunately, we had some uh, technical difficulty and dropped Chris. Uh, oh, oh, no. Always coming back. <laughs> um, yeah, we lost you there for a minute. If you want to uh, quickly wrap up, and we'll turn it over to uh, John and Howard for, yeah. their, for their comments. You were cut off 10 seconds ago, so we heard most of what you said. Yeah, um, we were almost lost. Just the last couple seconds. Sorry. Yeah. <laughs> um, so look, I'm going to go really fast because I know that uh, Blair, <laughs> Blair would like to play a role here too. Um, just a, a few quick points. One is uh, mobile versus landline. Our, our position isn't that they are currently separate markets, although they are um, exercising some competitive discipline on them. <clears throat> the point is that in as the years go on, we're going to see more and more blurring of the line. Um, I'm in Charlottesville, Virginia. Actually, I'm not even in Charlottesville. I'm eight miles west of Charlottesville in Albemarle County right now. I'm being served by Comcast. CenturyLink is the other alternative. But guess what? There's a third alternative. It's Verizon. Verizon is not a traditional landline provider in this con in, in this area, but it does offer this wonderful device called the MiFi. Now, I wouldn't want to rely on it for all of my broadband needs today because they um, obviously the pricing is different uh, for and it is higher for for use of this type of device, but. Uh, it will be the pricing will go low lower if you as we see 5G deployed because the capacity constraints on networks like Verizon will be diminished. It is true that today people often have mobile phones, mobile broadband connections, and fixed line broadband connections. It was also true 10 years ago that many people had both fixed broadband, fixed landline telephone connections, and mobile phones. Um, what do we see today? We see a convergence. People don't want to pay two bills. They want to pay one bill. And companies like Verizon and T-Mobile are going to come win home broadband customers in places like where I am right now. Um, uh, Chris, you you said uh, we can't avoid the Title I and Title II dis, uh, dispute because the FCC needs jurisdiction to do the right thing. I completely agree that the FCC needs jurisdiction to do the right thing. Um, I'm not certain that, um, that the only option is for the FCC to come up with solutions under its existing statutory scheme. I'm going to say something that 
people have said for a long time, maybe someday it'll come true. It's time for a new law. <laughs> it's time for Congress to step in and uh, take broadband into account, which it wasn't really able to do in 1996 and come up with an effective solution for all the policy issues that we've addressed. Finally, and I, I, um, I appreciate all of your points, Chris, about the need uh, to address uh, not just issues of economic regulation, but important critical policy issues that don't fall into the category of economic regulation. Um, it is also important to point out, we're not saying there should never be any economic regulation, even in broadband. So if you, you mentioned net neutrality, Howard and I are for no blocking, no throttling rules. Not because we think they're particularly essential, because we don't actually see a lot of blocking and throttling. In fact, we don't see any right now. But that also means that the cost of imposing those consumer norms on broadband are pretty small. So adopting baseline net neutrality principles um, passes a, the sort of cost benefit analysis that we want to see for economic regulation. And Howard, I'll turn it over to you. You're on mute. Sorry, I'll, I'll let Blair chime in and come back then. Uh, Chris, you know, a lot of good points to address. I think John, I share John's responses. And, and if there's time after Blair comments, I might come back to some of the important points you raised. Thanks. All right. Thanks so much, Howard and, uh, and John, Chris, uh, for those uh, for those thoughtful comments. Uh, I'd like to you know quickly introduce Blair Levin. Uh, many of you are familiar with him. Blair, appreciate your patience. Here we are, an hour in, uh, getting to hear your comments. Uh, you know, many of you in the audience, I'm sure, are familiar with Blair, but uh, but to run through his bio quickly, Blair's a non-resident senior fellow with the Metropolitan Policy Program at Brookings Institution. He's also a policy advisor to New Street Research, a Wall Street uh, investment advisory firm, um, and also serves as the, as the advisor on a variety of nonprofits, including on the board of uh, of ITIF. Um, he's deeply familiar with many of these topics, uh, previously served as Chief of Staff for FCC Chairman Reed Hunt, so familiar with some of the uh, 1996 uh, telecom implementation proceedings, um, and of course also led the team who wrote the uh, National Broadband Plan. So, Blair, i turn it over to you, same deal, five, uh, five ten minutes uh, uh, for your thoughts, reactions, and then we'll hear your response from John Harvey. Thanks. Great. Doug, thank you so much. and it's. Uh, Required no patience. It was an awful lot of fun listening to Howard and 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 John and Chris, uh, three really wonderful experts. And this is the kind of uh, discussion debate that people like me really love. Um, I I thought what I would do is just provide a little bit of historic, um, uh, shall we say, color on the commentary of the paper, which I which I found really great. Uh, I'm not saying I agree with 100 percent of it, but it was really thoughtful. Uh, required reading, I think, as we try to look forward. Uh, let me start with something of a defense, maybe, for, of the 96 Act, but only in this sense. I think that uh, for some of you watching, many of you maybe who weren't even born in 96, it's important to remember that Act started being drafted in 1973. It really picked up some momentum in the early 90s, uh, but it was really from 94 to 96. It is logical that it focused on the big issue, which is how do we get long distance into local and local into long distance, because at that point, wireless was very much an exclusive kind of service. It really wasn't until November 97 when AT&T introduced something called the One Rate Plan that people began to think of it as potentially, uh, and that was very nascent, uh, potentially a substitute for landline voice. And the same thing, cable broadband really wasn't introduced until I think it was actually 98. Uh, uh, At Home had been created before then, which was the primary cable broadband company, but it was uh, so in, in the context of doing the 96 Act, and the lesson here being that all legislation in a way is backward looking, um, they could not see what was about to happen in the next couple of years. As to the um, uh, National Broadband Plan, uh, I'm very grateful for the uh, compliments. I, I am amused by the notion of it demonstrating humility. It, it, that is a word that I somehow doubt will be in any of my obituaries. Um, which of course I will never get to read, uh, but but nonetheless, I, I, I it, it, you could call it that. You could also just call it something that came out of the analysis. Uh, but before talking about that, and uh, I want to thank you first of all for recognizing what has become one of my favorite quotes, which is about that we actually recognize what would happen in a pandemic and how important this kind of connectivity would be. Uh, I would also note that if we had had the broadband speeds we had ten years ago.
Uh, this last year would have been a total disaster for the economy, much more than it already was. But you also quoted something which I actually, in, in all seriousness, think, or I kind of wish might be the most quoted line from the plan, which is, as more aspects of daily life move online and offline alternatives disappear, the range of choices available to people without broadband narrows. Digital exclusion compounds inequities for historically marginalized groups. We also said the cost of digital exclusion is large and growing. And I think that uh, I'm gonna conclude just by talking about how I agree with you about the digital divides, because it tr turns out there's a relationship between the pandemic and the cost of digital exclusion. It really shines a spotlight on that. Um, but first, let me just go to the topic of economic regulation. You know, the regulatory humility did not keep us from proposing a number of things, incentive auctions, the first net thing, uh, or what became first net, reverse auctions, which I think was a, is a much better way of allocating funds for universal service. It also didn't keep us from, from recognizing that there were problems, but that policy wouldn't necessarily solve them. So, you know, we, we did have some changes suggested to Lifeline, but frankly, what we did talking with people at Comcast and what became Comcast Internet Essentials was actually far more important. Um, uh, but the biggest thing was Google Fiber. And I, I agree with the fundamental analysis about the dangers of economic uh, regulation if you have certain situations. But what we saw in 2009 and 10 was what we, it was kind of like a prisoner's dilemma where cable had the high end product, uh, telcos had a low end product, and it was kind of like the competition between, call it Saks Fifth Avenue and Walmart. Is that really competition? It's a, it's a difficult question question and it's complicated but i would say that the the danger we felt was that the cable that the, the telephone guys were not putting pressure on cable to increase the uh, the network speeds um and the telco both of them had an incentive to simply reap the um existing investments um uh, we didn't exactly know what to do with that from a policy perspective, because clearly as other countries were going to fiber, we didn't see that happening here. Google Fiber was fortunately a private action solution. It was not a successful business, but it was very successful from a policy perspective. Wrote an article about that in the Harvard Business Review that you can take a look at, but I think that was a key driver. And, and, and the reason I just mentioned that is I do think that um, it demonstrates that public policy processes should not only reflect public policy outcomes. There are other ways of identifying things and having more creative solutions. Um, uh, uh, and, I, and I think that Google Fiber was a very important, obviously I have friends who disagree, history is always difficult to argue about, but, uh, but the, the key point is both the telcos and the cable industry did upgrade their facilities rather substantially um, after Google Fiber started making it more attractive to do so. Um, but the big point that I wanna make is I completely agree with the conclusion of the paper, which is the digital divides are the most important issue, um, uh, I, I think, facing the country right now in terms of broadband policy. And I hope the administration, the new administration listens. I would actually argue there are three gaps, the availability gap, which you mentioned, which is the rural urban one. I think that the debate is largely tactical. The most recent art off auction, I think, could be seen as a success, not the success, however, that the FCC states, because there are gonna be some long-term problems, so I need to go into that now. But we fundamentally have a strategic way of addressing it. It's just a matter of how do we wanna spend money? When do we wanna spend money? What are some other um, tactical issues? The big thing is really adoption. That, that to me is the single biggest issue. Um, uh, approximately 80 million Americans uh, still haven't adopted. The big question here is we have to be clear about what we mean by affordability. And there are some people who think affordability is reflected by the average price of broadband. It is not, in my opinion. <laughs> it, what it really is, is the entry level price. And so we really need to focus on that. And I agree there has to be subsidies. I think we really have to completely rethink Lifeline, uh, which is fundamentally a mobile service and, and use a lot of new creative ways of, of addressing it. And, and I would just note in that regard that I and a bunch of other people, including Doug and other folks at ITIF, have been working uh, for some time with uh, various folks in the civil rights communities to try to develop a, a digital equity inclusion agenda, 
uh, we have some ideas on these issues, which we, which the civil rights folks will be uh, uh, rolling out in the relatively near future that I, I think will help further the debate that this um, uh, uh, paper um, uh, suggests. Um, I will just close by saying that um, getting back to the question of competition, I fundamentally agree with the conclusion of the paper. Um, I come at it a slightly different way uh, uh, with, with the, the conclusion of the paper that we don't know enough about 5G and its competitive impacts. And I would just note that on Wall Street, um, there, there are two really big debates. One is whether 5G is actually a threat to cable. I tend to be on the side that it's not as big a threat to cable as others believe. Um, uh, there are lots of different reasons for that, but here's my big point. There are people making bets on both sides. There's a high level of uncertainty and I might be wrong. Um, uh, the second debate is really about DISH because if DISH does what it says it's going to do, it could be really disruptive, not just to the wireless guys, but also to the wired guys. And so when you see that kind of debate going on on Wall Street, it tells you there's a high level of uncertainty. And in those kinds of situations, it's not at all clear to me that there's any government action in the kind of economic regulation um, uh, that would be would be helpful to that. We'll, we'll argue over time whether what the government did in allowing the T-Mobile deal to go through was was the right thing to do. But at at this moment in time, there was a great debate on Wall Street about what what kind of competition we're going to be seeing in two years, five years, ten years. Um, and with that, uh, let me turn it back over to uh, to you, Doug. Great, and, and I'll turn it quickly over to, to John and Howard if you have uh, uh, quick thoughts, uh, responses uh, to Blair. Yeah, just very, very quickly. Um, fully agree with Blair that when you think about affordability, average price is not, is not helpful. Uh, the question is, what do we do to bring people onto the first rung of the ladder? And to lower the middle rung doesn't really do a lot of, does, doesn't, do, doesn't do what we need to do socially. And uh, I share your hope that that will be dealt with seriously. Although, you know, a, a certain degree of trepidation there, Blair. I mean, I don't know how many Aspen Institute conferences we went through year after year talking about, you know, direct appropriations to solve affordability problems in telecom. And everyone always agreed it was a great thing to do and no one ever did it. So, you know, hopefully we'll see some will to really solve the problem. And my hope is that if the pandemic teaches us anything, you know, this is not a luxury, you know, to, to have access. So uh, hopefully that will be resolved. Um, with regard to Google Fiber, very interesting point. Um, you know, I think one of the lessons that I might draw from that is that one doesn't have to be a successful competitor to be the kind of threat that inspires significant innovation and investment. Uh, Google Fiber, of course, did not succeed. Um, who knows if Dish will succeed? Who knows if 5G will make the kind of pivot to overcome some of the you know problems that I think Chris rightly pointed out about you know the difference between mobile and fixed broadband. Um, so I think that, uh, you know, but the threat is one that is, I think, very real with significant, you know, significant bets being placed. And I think that that's one of the situations in which you do tend to see an investment being driven because you can't be flat footed three years from now and say, oh, actually, that business never succeeded because if it does succeed, it will eat your lunch. And I think that that's, you know, that's the possible hope of hope of dish. You know, that's that's a whole separate discussion whether whether that remedy was appropriate or not. Um, I do want to just address something that Chris raised because I think it was a really important point that he made. Um, Chris is right. The line between economic and non-economic regulation is not always crisp, and we can talk about certain kinds of regulation and say those are unquestionably economic uh, forms of regulation. We look at other forms of regulation, say those are enforce, you know, unquestionably uh, consumer protection rules. But there are some that tend to blur uh, at, at the middle and one should not use a label to obscure what is a real social need. And we need to debate each of those very seriously. Um, so there is, there is no effort here, I wanna make very clear uh, to avoid that debate. It's just that we, we have to get uh, in, into specificities that you know the scope of this paper didn't allow for. I do want to just address a couple of those, just one of those very quickly. Net neutrality is very interesting. As John said, he and I actually both big supporters of you know preventing blocking and throttling. When you start to go to the kinds of commercial interactions that occur between large players, uh, sort of on the backbone and the core of the internet, the the case for something like net neutrality or 
uh, sort of getting involved with those commercial regulations, uh, I think I think diminishes. So the question is, you know, how far does net neutrality go? To whom does it apply? I think there's serious debates there. Some of it may really not be about economics so much as about the public interest, but some of it ends up just dividing surplus between large economic players, uh, you know, in in sort of the stack. And we need to be able to have regulation that's capable, or at least a regulatory structure that's capable of making those distinctions. Um, and then finally, Chris, as to your point about um, where there are multiple players, fully agree. I mean, I'm just across the river from you, but I, I get three, and um, you know, I, I get three. I've got I've got Comcast, I've got Verizon, and I've got my my provider RCN. Um, and so, but but admittedly, there is there is something of a patchwork. I think the question we need to ask is, how does regulation solve that problem? Uh, rate regulation in Alexandria is not going to incentivize more players to come into Alexandria. And as we think about the possibilities for the kinds of things that might be coming around the corner and that are starting to become more of a reality, um, I think that the kinds of regulation John and I are talking about are actually likely to be antithetical to the kind of true structural fix in those markets that we think is more advantageous than a short term sort of sort of you know price reduction fix. And that's the trade off that 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 we have to think about. So I think thinking about how regulation solves those problems of incentivizing entry into those areas that are served by a single provider um, um, is an interesting one. Final point I'll make is just about demand. We should not lose track of shifting consumer demand as something that will drive the way people use these technologies and could drive convergence. Um, you know, I, I spend a lot of time observing um, uh, people in my household in their you know early 20s. They certainly concern, consume uh, these services far differently from the way I do. Um, that I, I, we shouldn't regulate by anecdote and do public policy by anecdote, but significant shifts in the kinds of things being consumed and how services are used also has a lot to do with what become reasonably interchangeable substitutes over time. And we shouldn't lose track of that part of the discussion. Excellent. Thanks so much. John, I don't know if you had any anything else to add as a response to Blair, or we can go uh, to Q&A with the short we time. We probably now. just go to Q&A. All right. So uh, we've got some uh, some good questions in the uh, in our in our platform. Uh, those in the audience, feel free to feel free to add more, and I'll keep an eye on those. But um, my my first question, um, and this is really something that that Chris and uh, you honed in on uh, right from the get go, um, that is this this sort of gray area between what constitutes economic regulation and and uh, you know, non economic consumer protection or other other forms of, of regulation. Um, and so we don't need to rehash the whole debate and, and save time, kind of a lightning round. But I I'm just curious, Howard and John, maybe if you want to start, but but does that sort of gray area, like do, how important are the margins there of what constitutes economic regulation versus non-economic regulation, if that makes sense? Is that sort of like if you take the, the really direct price controls off the table that does the vast majority of the work, or is a lot of the opportunity for innovation around business models or, or new entry um, in this sort of in that gray area. Do you think this is a, a real important distinction? So that's one question. And then question, second question, I'm always curious of um, questions around institutional design and process. Do you think that the, the APA process is, is sufficient or the, the sort of right um, right vehicle to have these important debates right between economic and non-economic regulations? Or as part of potential legislation, should we be looking at you know potential changes to, to how the FCC um, would uh, would actually you know move through the process of of making that distinction? If that makes sense. Yeah, I mean, so I'll go first. I mean, uh, you and Chris are, are both correct that, um, and and Howard pointed this out as well. Uh, there are some things that are obviously economic regulation. There are some things that are obviously not. And then there are some there are some things that people can argue about whether you want to call them that or not. Ultimately, the label doesn't matter very much. What matters is the effect of imposing a particular type of regulation on the marketplace. It is a the dichotomy, like all dichotomies, is a little bit simplistic, but it does help you conceptualize 
what are the appropriate ways of thinking about public policy issues. Net I mean, when we talk about economic regulation, usually in the background is some kind of premise about market power. So the sort of economic regulation that we have in mind is the sort of regulation that for the last hundred years or longer, regulators have imposed on stable monopolists. So obviously straight up rate regulation is economic. Uh, the sort of unbundling requirements, the network sharing obligations of the 96 Act, that was economic regulation, also obviously targeted at particular companies deemed to have market power, and they were designed to increase competition by making them share the, their assets, uh, their essential assets, with potential new entrants in the market. Net, net neutrality is, um, it, it's a very broad term, and there are some rules that people have proposed under the aegis of net neutrality that obviously constitute economic regulation, others where it's more of a gray area. The reason that it's slippery is because there are really two independent rationales for net neutrality rules. One of them relates to market power. There's a premise that ISPs have market power and they need to be subjected to these constraints on vertical relationship or vertical integration because otherwise there will be a competition problem. We can argue about that in you know, traditional antitrust terms, but there's another rationale for net neutrality rules, which is that um, there are enormous externalities to be gained from having the internet as a neutral, reliable platform for individual expression, for communication, and so forth. That is a, a very legitimate concern. The question when I think about net neutrality regulation is, is a particular industry practice likely? And if it's likely, does it implicate either of those two concerns? In other words, does it flow, for, does it tend to perpetuate market power in socially unproductive ways, or does it threaten the essential openness of the internet? Um, and to me, all net neutrality arguments ultimately come down to those, those issues. And I think Howard and I um, drew the line where we did in our paper because um, blocking and throttling really would pose a serious threat to the openness of the internet if it were to become widespread. Other prohibitions that are often associated with the term net neutrality are, um, um, d d are aimed at conduct that either hasn't occurred yet, <laughs> it may never occur, or if it does occur, wouldn't necessarily threaten the openness of the internet as a whole. And so we have more tolerance for experimentation in those areas than uh, people who favor brighter line prohibitions on conduct other than blocking and throttling. Any other thoughts, reactions? Uh, Let's go to another, maybe get another question. I agree with that. Uh, Sure. Yeah. Um, so I, I'm I'm curious. So many of these debates, uh, to my mind, kind of turn on predicting the future. Um, Blair, I don't know. Maybe you can take take this one first. But it's like so so many of these issues, you know, turn on how competition plays out. Of course, we can look back to history and try to make uh, make predictive judgments. Uh, but uh, but but do you think that there are ways in which we could incorporate within the rules, you know, predictions of you know if you know, certain metrics turn out uh, like this in five years or, or, or otherwise that we can, we can, you know, either sunset rules or uh, do you think there's much opportunity there uh, around uh, sort of building in potential uh, different paths uh, depending on, on our predictions of, you know, competition going one way with 5G or, or, or another? Uh, I think that's really hard, though. I'd be particularly interested in Howard's view since when he was at OIRA, that's in a way what he had to do, which would try to have a systemic approach to that, that kind of regulation. Uh, I, I would simply say that um, I see this debate, one of the interesting things about the digital divide debates is uh, you not only have to say kind of what's the entry level price, but also what's the entry level service. And once you get to the service, you have to make kind of comments about Downward speeds, upward speeds, data caps, a number of other things that Chris was was noting. So there, there's 
multiple, multiple dimensions. I'll, I'll turn it over to Howard to answer it, but I'll simply say that based on an experience which thankfully neither John nor Howard mentioned in their paper, which was the experience of the FCC in implementing the 1992 Cable Act, uh, which explicitly called for rate regulation, and which we did, and which did not, it worked in the short term, because it's pretty easy to get rates to go down. Then the question is, what happens when they start adding new programming, which of course right. they were going to do. Long complicated story, but the point is, you can regulate a quart of, the price of a quart of milk, a kilowatt of electricity. It's really hard to regulate a dynamic product, which is adding security features and you know bonus programming and a thousand other dimensions. Yeah, I mean, yeah. Just, just re real quick, quick response to that. I mean, it, the regulatory design problem is an extremely difficult one, and you know, look, we're seeing it play out in real time in many cases. Um, you know, companies have to invest for the long term. Regulation is often a high fixed cost, low incremental cost proposition. Regulatory compliance. So, for example, you know, you you see you. Could, you know, you see like auto companies not believing the reduction in admission standards and not acting accordingly because they know darn well those are going to come back and they have to comply with the rest of the world. So you always have to think in terms of what's what what has to be done uh, sort of longer term. Um, I will say, you know, and this relates to your earlier question, Doug. Um, look, we don't have, we actually have a pretty good system in the APA rulemaking process. When you go around the world and you see what, how rulemaking is done, uh, in terms of transparency, uh, participation and accountability, you'll, you'll, you'll not find a better system. Does it, does, is it well suited to optimizing regulation? It's probably better than the congressional process of compromise. So the, the, the deferment, the deferral of the key hard issues, look, Telric was a, you know, thought of and designed by some really, really smart people. Um, you know, it had flaws. It came down to how different, you know, folks actually implemented it and what the actual values are. And, you know, idealized network elements were maybe not the best idea. But, you know, the fact is it was better than you would have gotten through a legislative deliberative process subject to a lot of challenge, which it received in the courts. Is it well suited to coming up with an optimized economic regulation in a short period of time? That is, say, a period of time while it will still do some good? Uh, I don't think so. But it's the best system we have, and it doesn't mean we should give up. If economic regulation is appropriate, that's how we should go about doing it. And, you know, this is done quite successfully in a lot of ag agencies with participatory regulatory models. So I don't think that the institutional design problem is unsolvable. Uh, but I do think in a dynamic technological uh, situation, it makes it really, really hard. And sunsets and wait and sees don't work that well and can undermine you know, any kind of compliance at all. So I do think we end up in a more binary situation. Do we jump in or don't we? And then we can just do the best that we can um, you know, under, under, under the circumstances. And I, I think that... Um, you know, I, I do think that it is not impossible to get good regulation out of the system that we have. It's easier for some kind of regulations than others. Um, I think that when you start putting in, by the way, another form of economic regulation, build out requirements and things like that, it gets very difficult, it requires a lot of upfront investment uh, that can then have real long term consequences for the entry conditions and how competitors see the market going forward. On the other hand, to get to something Chris issued uh, or you know, addressed earlier, which is sort of a form of build out obligation, but a soft one, anti redlining, that may have costs, but I think the social benefits are so, you know, they may not be quantifiable in the same way, but they are, you know, huge. So we can have those and, and have those trade offs and maybe worry less about the deterrence. What are we deterring? We're deterring entry from a market no one's entering. Let's not worry about that, you know? These tend to be, so I think there are different kinds of rules that border on the economic, um, but the true economic rules are going to have longer term consequences and, and significant upfront um, investment effects. And I think that in an uncertain environment, the regulatory uh, design technology is, is, is not obviously up to the task. Doug, if I could, before we go, uh, if I could take... Sure. I think Howard's thinking okay, yeah. probably a step further than he would want me to. Uh, but uh, uh, I agree. I don't think, uh, you know, I think the APA is probably the best we have right now. Um, 
and congressional action uh, loses the opportunity for nuance that I think Howard was describing. Um, and, and if we all, and it sounds like we all subscribe to the idea that there is economic uh, regulation, there's non-economic, and there's a, a significant uh, or yet important, if you don't think it's significant in a large way, uh, an important uh, mix of the two. Um, this is why I came back to the, the authority question uh, and Title II, because uh, the, the legal jurisprudence has proven that we can't get at that gray area without it. Um, whether you, you rewrite the act, John, or whether you know we stick with what we have under the law, um, that a regulatory body uh, empowered to look at these hard things is critically important. I think you guys are making the case for it, whether it's digital redlining, whether it's where we seem to agree, disagree on net neutrality, uh, because I certainly want uh, rules beyond uh, just a no blocking and no throttling uh, uh, prohibition. Um, and, and how do we wrestle with the mix of the economic and the public interest in data caps or an interconnection between a small town provider and a, and a large Comcast uh, without an agency empowered to do it uh, and to deal with that nuance. So, so you know, I take Howard's point, and that's where I land. I mean, to me, you guys are making an argument for, if you take an economic example, an argument for, at minimum, the baseline um, uh, 2015 order, uh, no blocking, no throttling, no pay prioritization rule, which had then flexibility built into it uh, to look at things like data caps, to look at things like interoperability, to, um, you know, they actually went further than I would on, on an outright ban on, on price regulation, but at least they, they set some parameters that uh, people could work on in the future on that gray area. So, so I think that's where the, the space is for regulatory policy in the future. Great, thanks so much, Chris. So I wanna be respectful of everyone's time and we are actually, um, at the at twelve thirty, but I do want to, uh, if, if you all have a, a moment to to give everyone the, an opportunity for quick parting thoughts. Uh, in particular, we had a couple of uh, questions uh, from the audience related to you know how this discussion relates to uh, deployment of broadband, especially in rural areas. Uh, so if you have you know parting thoughts, um, and, and I know it's like it's a, a conversation that we could do uh, do a whole other hour and a half on, but uh, but quick uh, quick thoughts on rural broadband. Uh, Perhaps in particular the um, issue of uh, a satellite and how uh, the role of the uh, satellite uh, raises new questions. Uh, um, in particular, you know, SpaceX having won uh, uh, at least provisionally a number of uh, a number of the RDOF uh, options for uh, providing a rural broadband. So yeah, quick parting thoughts and, and maybe maybe particularly thoughts on uh, on rural deployment. Should we uh, go in order? Start with you, Howard, and just go down the line. I'll just say very quickly. I think it's. I think I can. I think about it as an infrastructure problem. I think we have to deal with some of the market, you know, structure issues there. But I feel like this is a significant public infrastructure problem, and I do think that rural access is uh, sometimes overlooked. Apparently, urban access is sometimes. Oh, <laughs> yeah. Um, Unfortunately, we go oh, back, Aaron. Well, I would say a vital problem that goes well beyond being uh, a, a telecom problem. It's 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 a it's it's an economic opportunity issue that I think should be a matter of significant public infrastructure investment um, in terms of of providing the access and the incentives for the uh, for the facilities to get there. Great. Thanks, John. And uh, yes, and obviously, I mean, they, there are mechanisms in place now involving um, reverse auctions and the like to right. um, incentivize private investment in rural areas. It is definitely a problem, and I'm speaking as someone who's probably dialing in from one of the more rural areas right now. Um, it does actually remind me that we, you know we often talk in terms of where the industry is headed, as though at any given time it's um, is going to be in one place throughout the United States or in a different place throughout the United States. And in reality, the evolutions that we're talking about are, are locality specific. So when I talk, for example, about the 5G revolution and the convergence of mobile and fixed line, there's is more complex than that uh, because there will be some areas, particularly metropolitan areas, where you will see sooner head-to-head -head competition between mobile and fixed line than uh, than you will in others. So rural areas may take longer because of the need for ubiquitous fiber backhaul. 
Um, so it, rural is, is always, you know, in terms of infrastructure, um, the, uh, the, the challenge even after we have great technological and competitive advances in more populous areas. Blair, if you have uh, part of thoughts? Cool. Uh, a couple, just very quick comments. Uh, number one, we've actually made a lot of progress um, using old mechanisms. The Department of Agriculture a couple months ago gave out uh, grants to get fiber to premises that averaged thirty-three thousand dollars per home. Uh, the FCC, using a reverse auction mechanism, uh, just did the same for a lot more homes, averaging between fifteen hundred and three thousand. I think that's progress. Now, it's not perfect, right? Because what's going to happen is a lot of the folks who said we're going to we promised to build up to one hundred percent of the homes five years from now will say, did we say one hundred percent? We really meant sixty percent. But don't take away our money because that means we can't get from sixty to seventy. So those, there's there's always these problems, and we shouldn't ignore them. And the FCC did some things I thought were wise, uh, some others that not so much. But as to Starry, it's a really difficult problem. Because one of the things that the Starry, I'm not arguing with the decision, but a natural consequence of allowing them to win is they're going to raise the cost of getting fiber to certain other areas because you now have a lot of non-contiguous areas. It's going to be much more expensive. And they're going to be offering you know, a decent, though highly priced service. 100 bucks a month is not cheap. And I'll simply say something we haven't started to address is what happens to rural institutions, hospitals, governments, uh, colleges, some some others, when you know it, the, the consumers entirely go to either satellite or, or 5G uh, or some other kinds of fixed wireless. So we will continue to have these debates, and we'll continue to have to go back to Aspen to discuss them. I hope. <laughs> Great, thanks, Blair. Yeah, I agree. Uh, SpaceX uh, uh, entering the fray and with the hard off auctions raises a lot of a lot of questions. Chris, uh, parting thoughts, and we'll and we'll wrap up. Yeah, just pull together. It looks like we may need to go to Aspen, Blair. I'm I'm good with that. Um, <laughs> because John's point about um, uh, you know not trying to predict too much because technology changes. A few years ago, you asked me about satellite. I'm like, satellite's not good enough. Now you've got uh, the new low Earth orbit stuff, and I'm like, oh. I'm interested. Let's talk. Um, so we have to mix, you know, uh, that flexibility with the economic analysis that Blair was just talking about, which I think is important. Uh, as long as we are rooting it in, you know, the idea of having, uh, you know, uh, not congressional authority and not just antitrust authority, but a regulatory body, is that we are rooting it in certain values uh, that we're serving everyone, that it's affordable, um, uh, that there's a certain quality of service. Um, you know, these are these have to be foundational, and so we have to pull these steps together. Excellent, thank you. Uh, with that, uh, we'd love to thank all of you for for joining. It's a wonderful discussion. I wish we had uh, more time to uh, to have uh, even uh, further conversation. But Howard and John, thank you for your presentation, your great paper, Blair and Chris for your thoughtful comments. Really appreciate your all's time and insights. Thank you so much, and thanks everyone in the audience for for joining us. Thanks, everyone. Good to see you.